Okay, so let's get going. Uh, hello, good morning, good morning everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Roy and uh, today we'll talk a little bit about uh, ranges. Uh, so uh, as I said, uh, I'm from here, from Israel. I live in Tel Aviv. Uh, I've been uh, doing C++ for quite a while now, and uh, for the last 11 years or so, I've been working for Istra Research. We're a low latency trading company uh, out of uh, Israel, and uh, we'll be happy to uh, solve uh, great problems with you. And if you're in, in, into interesting uh, performance challenges, please come talk to me. Um, so today we'll talk about uh, libraries and about ranges, okay? Uh, we'll try to understand why people want to write libraries, how people write them, what their motivations might be and how they uh, might go at it. And then we'll uh, look into the ranges library as sort of an example of a, a great library that uh, we can all use and also think about uh, uh, it, it when we write our own libraries. So uh, um, what is a library? When you talk about a software library, what, what comes to mind uh, first when, when you think about a, what a software library is? Okay, so I uh, personally, uh, when I thought about it initially, I thought that it's like code for coders. It's not code that we write for someone else or for other people in other professions. We write libraries for other coders to use. Um, I sometimes consider libraries as like self-contained, reusable parts of software that we can go and ship uh, with many, many different applications. Um, sometimes libraries can be considered as like an abstraction layer, something that has like an external interface and an uh, internal implementation where people are maybe not supposed to know or care too much about what's going on inside. Um, sometimes libraries are even uh, uh, sort of like a language within a language. Uh, those are typically called the, like domain-specific languages, where if you get to know and work with a library, you're all of a sudden in a different world and it's not just plain, pure C++. And uh, uh, other people think of libraries as just building blocks where like you can take a, a many, many different libraries and just put them together in sort of like whatever arrangement you like. And again, consider each one of them as sort of like an atomic uh, piece. Um, and uh, a main thing, again, when people think about libraries is uh, the notion of an API, right? How uh, the outside communicates with the inside uh, and that, uh, the API might want to be very, very simple, but the implementation inside can be sometimes tricky. And uh, sometimes what we want to do if we have a tricky implementation is to wrap it in ideally a simple API. Um, and the last uh, uh, or kind of notion of uh, what a library is, is just words, it's vocabulary, okay? When I have a good library, it just adds more words to my language and uh, it can uh, make me really uh, like uh, enhance the, the level of uh, discussion when, when I talk about software. I don't just need to speak about uh, lower level stuff, I can talk in a higher language. So uh, let's uh, start with a short clip. We're in a cinema after all and uh, see uh, um, Gerald Sussman, who's one of the authors of uh, SICP, the Structured Imp Interpretation of uh, Computer Programs, which is like a seminal book about uh, software design from the mid 80s. But the important thing is that between these and these, we set up an abstraction barrier. We set up a layer of abstraction. And what was that layer of abstraction? That layer of abstraction was precisely the constructor and the collectors. This layer was make wrap and humor. And deny. This methodology, right, this methodology, another way to say what it's doing is that we're separating, we're separating the way something is used, separating the use of data objects from the representation of data objects. Okay, so uh, this is a, a short, uh, uh, you know, descri description of a rational number library that uh, uh, Sussman uh, presented here. And he's basically telling us uh, that this is a, a main uh, part of, uh, of a library, Just trying to separate how people use it from what's the implementation, trying to create an abstraction layer. And that's something uh, that we can keep in mind. Um, so uh, why should we write libraries? Okay, uh, you know, outside people, the committee, uh, you know, big uh, researchers can write libraries, but we can also, or should also uh, write our own libraries. Um, 
And the reasons are multiple. First of all, we said that libraries are a, bit a method of reuse. So obviously, we don't want to repeat ourselves. So whenever we think that that's something we should reuse, we can use libraries for that. Um, as we mentioned, uh, we want to raise our level of discussion. So uh, if we write a library, we can introduce new nouns, new words into our language, and that can really uh, help us. And we can make it really, um, we can talk in the language that makes most sense to our company, to our uh, team, to our group. Um, and also, whenever we think we have uh, building blocks, libraries uh, should uh, come into mind and into thought. Um, and typically, the higher we go, uh, the closer we are to our customers or users, change is typically more likely because the users want more change, they want more feature. But uh, sorry, but, but the lower we are, that's a typo in the, in the slide, that's where, when things are more stable and potentially more robust. Okay, so a, a, a low level library has more chances of being robust, of being more resistant uh, or, or resistant to change. Or th there's less, less of a need uh, or less of a chance that uh, some outside force will go and, and, and mess up with those uh, uh, lower level uh, libraries. And if we think about the, the libraries as abstraction layers, we also uh, I know that uh, complexity can be safer when it's well encapsulated, okay? So again, if we have something that's complex, we want to, to, to encapsulate it. And uh, typically, lower level of code is, is better defined. Again, less change uh, from the outside. We can define our preconditions, our postconditions, our invariants in, in, in a better way because it's less uh, um, uh, exposed to, to the outside, to the environment. Um, and typically, that makes it more testable, okay? So if you write something in a library many times, we can write our code more in a more testable fashion. And those are reasons why writing libraries is not just uh, something that uh, other people do, it's something that we should do, okay? And uh, um, we should also think it, bear in mind that it's not just library code and application code. It's, it's a whole stack, it's a whole layer. There's like, uh, you know, libraries all the way uh, down, basically. And when we write our own libraries, we don't uh, just write it on plain C. We can use other libraries on top of other libraries, and that way we can raise, raise our level, raise uh, the quality of our code uh, in, in this manner. And uh, just uh, last month, I've been uh, to the CPP Now conference, and uh, here's a slide from a talk by Sean Parent, where he also uh, discussed uh, writing safe C++ code and, and uh, the future of uh, C++ in, in his mind. And this is one of the slides where he you know, envisioned one uh, potential uh, future, and he actually took it to a very extreme case of, of like, sort of like a duality, where our code should uh, maybe either be uh, as part of a large library of uh, generic components that are very, very proven, like this library of uh, hardcore things, and uh, anything else can maybe be uh, just uh, declarative forms of assembling those uh, components, those building blocks. Uh, and, and he said that potentially those, uh, that uh, second layer can maybe not even be Turing complete. Okay, the, all of the logic, all, all the, you know, the, the good stuff, the, the big computations can be done in a library, so much so that uh, the rest that we need might, uh, might not even need to be Turing complete. So that's uh, something uh, to, to think about. And when we think about what we uh, want to write and when, whether we're writing a library or writing application code, um, if it's complicated, maybe you want to put it in a library. So uh, how do we do it? How do we go about um, just adding things to our own library or adding things to someone else's library? How do you think about um, taking, com taking a component, taking a piece of software and making it part of a library? So uh, there are plenty of tips uh, uh, online. And uh, both uh, Christopher DeBella and Eric Liebler has, uh, have talks and uh, Twitter uh, posts about uh, uh, you know, a methodology where you should typically start with algorithms. You should typically start and write code that you specifically need. It doesn't have to be generic, just something that you need for your own, uh, uh, for your own uh, use case. And once you have that and it's working, that's when you can go and uh, do the iterative process of generalizing it, distilling it, trying to understand what's the core notion behind uh, that uh, algorithm that, uh, that I needed and, and, and I wrote. And uh, the interesting thing is, that is many times when we generalize our code, it actually becomes simpler. Okay, so uh, many times good library code, if it's not, if it's, the more generic it is, you find that it's actually simpler. It, it, it doesn't uh, get, more complex as, as it uh, deals with more cases. And that, that's, I think, a good telltale of good library code. Um, and uh, many times uh, out of that library, we start thinking about our, our APIs, we start thinking about our interaction with our users, and that's when uh, many times uh, concepts will emerge. And I'm talking about concepts both like in the in English notion and on the C20 notion. Um, we basically try to figure out what are the generic attributes of the different objects that I'm working with, and those are concepts. 
And uh, obviously, there are also many tips tell us, telling us that uh, we should pay attention to this API, this barrier. It's really important. Um, there are many talks, and even in this conference, about uh, making those APIs easy to use and hard to misuse. Um, when we write our APIs, we should be clear about our preconditions and our post conditions. Those are contracts, and we should uh, document them well so that those users, even the, the user is myself, 20 minutes from now, I, I, I better know what the preconditions and post conditions are. And uh, another uh, you know, key uh, point that uh, Alexander Stepanov, the uh, implementer and the I guess, creator of the STL, uh, got us to thinking about is that whenever we have a useful piece of information that we calculate during the argument, we should really think about returning it back to our user. If we're doing anything that's meaningful, even if it's not the exact thing that uh, the user asked me to do, I should find a way to maybe pass it back to the user because uh, we don't want to throw uh, uh, good work to waste. Um, and then when we think about types, we should aim for regular algebraic types, okay? Regular types are those that uh, we can basically think about that are similar to int, right? That we can uh, copy around, that we can compare. And uh, if we're talking about the uh, algebraic, uh, those are, you know, mathematical notations of uh, uh, these types that uh, can have uh, various relationships and sometimes have uh, proven uh, um, behaviors that uh, relate to some theoretical work that we can build on and rely on. Um, so. Value semantic objects typically behave well in the C++ language. The C++ language knows about constants of objects and values. It knows about uh, uh, copy versus reference, etc. And if we make our uh, classes and our objects value semantic oriented, then the language will work better with it. Um, and uh, those types uh, and, and operations that we think about, we can try to look at them mathematically. Do we have uh, an algebraic group? Is it a monoid? Is it a monad? Those are like very high level uh, theoretical uh, notions that sometimes we don't really need to think about. But if we do, and suddenly we understand that our types and our objects that we're working with adhere to some mathematical rules, it can give us some better ideas on how to generalize them, wh which operations we want to, want to write on them, and which operations might totally not make sense for these types of objects. So uh, uh, we have a, a, an understanding, we want to start with algorithms. So where do we find algorithms? I want to write my own library. Where, where do I find it? And uh, the, the key observation is that uh, algorithms are everywhere. You know, it's not just in the textbooks. Um, you can find them in many, many places. We can find good algorithms when we look uh, far away in other languages, in other libraries that other people uh, wrote, but we want to maybe adjust or modify. We can look, look at academic and research papers. Um, but really, we can also look in our own code bases. We already have algorithms hiding in our own code bases, and if we know what to look for them, it can sometimes be a good uh, you know, starting point, a good launching pad to, to really thinking about our code as libraries. Um, so again, let's uh, make use of the projector and uh, uh, see uh, a, a short uh, snippet from uh, Alexander Stepanov, as mentioned, he's the creator of the STL, and he's telling us a little bit about this uh, uh, art or this uh, operation of um, uh, finding new algorithms. Unfortunately, you know, the, in the 20th century, there is a very wrong idea of science uh, developed in popular culture. And Einstein, who was, of course, a great scientist, is partially responsible for that. The idea is that scientist is somebody who has long hair, never gets a haircut, uh, seldom washes, and discovers some wonderful, wonderful things uh, because of some inspiring breakthroughs. And science is actually, uh, it's something you do on a regular basis. Uh, I think a much better paradigm for a scientist is somebody like Carl Linnaeus, who established modern, modern uh, zoology, which is you send people, you send your disciples all over the world to bring you examples of animals and other living species, and then you try methodically to classify them. Science is about classification. Science is not about great inspiration. Okay, so science is about classification, not about great inspirations. We just look around, we send our disciples to look for different types of uh, algorithms. We classify them, we try to understand what are they, what, how can we use them. And this, this is the methodology that uh, Stepanov uh, basically encourages us to do. Um, so we talked a little bit about that, now let's look into uh, ranges. Uh, questions so far, by the way? Okay, great. Um, so ranges is, I think, a breakthrough library inside the, uh, the STL. Um, it's one of the big uh, four features uh, of C++20. Um, 
it can really be a paradigm shift and uh, an eye-opener for people who first uh, encounter them. And I encourage you to watch uh, uh, other talks about uh, ranges. And uh, obviously, it's not, uh, it, wasn't, uh, com it didn't come up from a vacuum. It rests on decades of existing libraries and existing experience. First and foremost, it rests on the C++ 98 iterator-based model. Okay? We, many of the algorithms, many of the notions um, that are in the ranges library came out of ideas that uh, you know, were first laid in C++ 98 and, and you know, theoretical thought and work that was done there and wasn't uh, you know, possible uh, to implement easily uh, in, in 1998, and you know, it came to life in, C in 2020. Um, it also rests on the, some fundamentals of uh, uh, functional and vectoric languages like uh, APL, BQN, R, Julia, and NumPy. Um, there are various talks and uh, podcasts from uh, uh, Conor Hoekstra talking about uh, you know, this uh, entire rich uh, space of, uh, of languages and algorithms that can be very, very useful. And the ranges library basically gives some of that, or a lot of that even, to us uh, in the C++ uh, community. And, uh, you know, as time went by, there are other languages that are very, very similar in nature uh, uh, to C++, uh, like uh, D, Rust, and Java, who also, uh, you know, implemented their own models of ranges and iterators. And there's a, another great talk by Barry Revzin, who, who compares between the two. And uh, the ranges library really um, had the benefit of, uh, you know, being uh, some, somewhat uh, uh, coming into the game a little later um, into productization. Uh, than others, uh, so that it can learn from others' mistakes and be really in the forefront. Um, and I think that the main innovation of the ranges library is composability. It has several uh, layers of composability, and I think that's what uh, really makes it shine. Um, so first of all, many of the algorithms uh, in the ranges library, they take ranges as inputs and return ranges as outputs. Okay, and that way we have like sort of a, like a currency that can be moved from one algorithm into another without uh, complicating the code, without doing any transformations. That's, uh, you know, compared to this C++ 98 iterator model where we had uh, like a begin iterator and an end iterator and uh, the result uh, uh, of, of an algorithm is typically just one of them and sometimes it's a pair of uh, two iterators but it's not something that can be really easily passed from one to another. And uh, the ranges algorithms, they have, they're more, um, regular in that matter, and that way that makes them compose uh, better. Um, and then uh, the second uh, uh, type of composability has to do with this notion of range adapters. Range adapters are these encapsulations of lazy ranges and uh, uh, that actually do algorithms um, uh, without uh, looking like an algorithm, but more like looking like, a, like an object or something that uh, we can pass around from one place to another. Uh, those uh, lazy ranges are also called views. And uh, uh, this uh, duality where these adapters sometimes are thought of and considered to be algorithms and other times are considered as objects that can be passed around and, and, and composed sort of like uh, expression templates really makes them uh, powerful and makes them like a, a, a compositional uh, type of uh, notion. And uh, lastly, there's also a new uh, notion in the ranges library of projections. It's not uh, very, very novel, but it also it, it added just another layer of indirection to many of the algorithms and that added a lot of uh, power uh, to, to the way that we uh, write and use uh, the STL algorithms without needing to make very, very complicated uh, you know, comparators or other uh, you know, workarounds in order to just uh, uh, look at the information, um, not, uh, not as it is, but uh, with some minor uh, transformations. So let's look at some examples of the uh, composability. Um, so first of all, as you mentioned, algorithms can chain much uh, better because inputs and outputs some, many times are ranges. I can uh, search for the string uh, uh, ABC inside some input string. Um, and the output of that is just a range, so it can be uh, you know, sent into the reverse just as it is, and, uh, and, and it works. Okay? We don't need uh, to pass around and think about uh, where do I need uh, to pass uh, the, uh, colon, colon, the, the begin pointer, the end pointer, uh, and, and mess with all those things. Um, Similarly, views, as we mentioned, are composable lazy ranges. And uh, they also uh, uh, gave us uh, this pipe operator as, as, as a nice uh, little present that allows us to take a string, split it by uh, uh, space, for example, the two words, and then just take the first two words. And this is all just looks like uh, a nice uh, expression, read it from, from left to right. And it looks, it's very, very composable. You can just uh, you know, write in your own longer and longer expression as, as, as it makes uh, sense to you. Um, and this duality of uh, value of algorithm also helps us write our own building blocks. So in this uh, example, which is also, I think, uh, pretty commonly uh, noted, I'm creating a variable, which is an object, but it's actually an algorithm. 
Okay, and this is like this uh, square evens uh, variable is a generic algorithm um, that is basically you know filtering out anything that's uh, even after conversion to int, and then uh, it goes in the uh, squares all those uh, uh, all those uh, elements, and this is totally generic. I can then uh, I can use this with a range of uh, integers, with a range of doubles, with, with anything that uh, can be converted to int and have a model operation and, and be squared. I can use this. And this uh, object is, is an object that can be passed around, but it's also an algorithm. Um, so the STL uh, has many, many uh, views. Um, I uh, tried to create a, a, a large list and, and, and categorize it. You don't have to remember all of it. And uh, I also omitted uh, some, uh, uh, some views for, for brevity. But uh, just uh, to give you some sense of what we have, so where uh, we have factories, uh, so object, so like again views that uh, represent uh, ranges, although they do not get uh, ranges as inputs, like uh, the empty range, a single element range, uh, iota for uh, consecutively increasing uh, uh, integers, and uh, the repeat range added in 23 that just repeats the same uh, element over and over again. And we also have uh, what I'd call rank preserving uh, uh, views that uh, take in. Uh, uh, a, view, uh, a range of certain types of elements and uh, return um, views with, with this, the, the same sort of notion of, uh, of, of these elements and not, uh, in, not moving, uh, like we see later, to like higher dimensions. Um, so uh, all basically converts uh, like old style uh, uh, containers into uh, ranges, filter just uh, removes elements or keeps elements that match, match some criteria. Transform can change uh, the elements types, but typically, if, if I have uh, an input range of one shape, then the, the transform will return uh, a range of the same shape. Um, take and take while, drop and drop while are ways to just uh, take uh, prefixes and suffixes uh, of given ranges. Uh, counted allow me uh, counted uh, ranges or view allowed me to uh, look at some uh, subrange, some consecutive subrange of an input range. Reverse. Is, is pretty clear. Stride in C++23 just takes every nth uh, element, like every second element, every third element, etc. cetera. Uh, zip transform allows me to take uh, maybe multiple uh, ranges uh, as input and, and output just one uh, through a transformation uh, on, on like pairwise or tuplewise transformations uh, on them. But again, if the input uh, ranges are of a sing some shape, the output will typically be of the same shape. And adjacent transform is also similar, but works like on a pairwise uh, 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 pairwise uh, computations within the input uh, range itself. And then there's uh, uh, the views that uh, do something with, uh, with the rank of, uh, of ranges. And rank basically means like the level of hierarchy that we have inside a range. A range can be just a range of elements or, or ints, but it can also have a range of ranges or a range of tuples. Right, and uh, this also adds a layer of composability. If you can have ranges of, of ranges of ranges, um, it makes our code sometimes uh, more more you know, more composable, or allows our library to be more, more flexible. So, the elements, the keys, and values uh, views they take uh, ranges of tuples and basically pick one of the um, or, or, or pick some of the the, uh, the elements out of those tuples and, and just extract them. Um, if we have an input that is a range of ranges, then the join views will uh, basically collapse them or flatten them. Um, if we're talking about increasing the ranks, so the zip, uh, uh, the zip uh, view will take several input ranges that you know just treat them as if they're the same length or take the minimal length uh, out of them and just uh, create one uh, range of tuples uh, out of all those uh, like in a pairwise fashion. Uh, enumerate will just add indexes, uh, similar to the Python enumerate uh, call. And the uh, Cartesian product is very much like zip in its interface, but it just goes over all uh, um, combination and not just pairwise combinations. And uh, adjacent as well uh, just uh, turns uh, uh, a range of item into a range of pairs of each item and its uh, uh, adjacent uh, neighbor. Um, and if we're talking about a uh, range of ranges, something more dynamic, then we also have uh, the split and lazy split. Uh, the slide that goes like with sliding windows and uh, the chunk uh, family of views that again take uh, some sort of a range and, and convert it to a range of ranges, increase our, our rank. And uh, there's uh, obviously a large uh, plan for uh, uh, adding more views and adding more uh, uh, tools to the, to, to the ranges library. There's a, a good paper that was written pre-C23 with sort of like a roadmap. Um, a lot of uh, what was in the paper 
um, entered into C++23, and uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, those things that didn't uh, make the cut will probably end up in C++26 in some way or form. So that's uh, a little bit about ranges uh, question. Cool. So now uh, we're into the heart of the matter. Um, let's uh, combine uh, uh, you know, what we've learned about uh, writing our own libraries and the ranges uh, thing and uh, try to find some inspirations, find some ways to maybe make suggestions, write our own uh, range-like uh, code and algorithms. So uh, let's uh, go a little bit, one uh, uh, almost last time, uh, to Stepanov uh, about uh, the methodology and what he recommends that we do. I have to meet occasionally with people who are doing they're called research and computer science. Uh, they say, well, I don't know. I don't have any ideas. No, you have to have any ideas. Go catch rabbits. Go look at people's code. Don't find what they do and try to, to abstract it. OK, so we don't need to have great ideas. We just look, need to look at our code, look at people's code, and try to abstract it. OK? So my first uh, attempt at this was actually last year in the CPP on C conference. There was a great talk uh, by uh, Tina Ulbrich where she uh, uh, basically uh, also showed the way of how to take uh, this uh, library that was relatively new then and uh, convert the old code into new one. And uh, she had a relatively complex uh, um, example regarding this uh, method and this algorithm used uh, to basically try to uh, divide the seats in a parliament based on some uh, democratic uh, party-based uh, uh, voting system, and in this example, which basically you know has like a case where we have like a voting to a parliament with, that has seven seats, and uh, three parties are uh, uh, you know are running for, for, for the ballot, and uh, each party gets a different number of votes, and uh, we need to understand how do we divide the seven seats between the parties, and uh, there's this known method, and the method basically says that uh, um, you take the like the seven. Uh, um, members or seven candidates of each uh, party, uh, you give uh, each of them sort of like a score based on the number of votes that the party gave and, and their place in, inside the list. And then we can uh, basically sort the scores of all of those candidates and uh, the top seven will, uh, will be in. So in this case, uh, uh, the first uh, seat will go to party number one because they uh, have the top score. The second seat will go to party number two. The third seat will all go back to party number one. The fourth to party number two. And then the fifth will go to party number one, the six seat will go to party number three. It had very little votes, but it's still enough to make the cut with one uh, seat. And the last uh, uh, seat will go to party number two. So I hope that uh, makes sense with this uh, short example. And uh, Tina basically shows us how we can uh, write this code in a range-based fashion, how we can break this entire thing into several composable steps. And uh, you know, one of the, uh, the, the key steps there is that uh, she, we need to generate the information about all those cells with all those scores, and then we need to sort them and take the, the you know the top seven, take take the best ones. And uh, this is not her, uh, you know, her her eventual outcome, but this uh, um, code snippet from from her talk is uh, sort of like w one of the steps that she did, where we basically need to uh, take those proportional votes of those scores, range, uh, sort them by by the greater. Uh, um, a predicate to make uh, the top scores uh, come up to the end, and then we can uh, resize that vector with all the cells to the number of seeds that we have. Okay, and uh, uh, looking at that made me wonder: okay, can this be uh, done better? Can this be improved? And my main uh, motivation was the fact that uh, you know most of the cells in the table are basically left uh, empty. Okay, this uh, resize operation basically means that uh, you know we're, we're taking only the top uh, uh, scores, and uh, we spent so much time creating this uh, very large uh, table or very large vector and sorting all of it just to, to drop uh, a lot of information, it, it seems like it, it might be wasteful. And uh, uh, so, so my observations were that, uh, first of all, sort uh, is, is an e it's, it's an eager algorithm. It's not a, it's not a view. It's, a, it's, it's not really easy. It doesn't really make sense to make sort into a view. Um, it may be like the new notion of uh, range's action, but uh, it, it's not a view uh, per se. Um, and it does eager evaluation, and it needs the pre-calculated uh, you know, pre storage. It needs the, the S times P cells of storage so it can sort uh, uh, on them. And the resize also implies that we're sorting too much. Okay? There are better algorithms, even in the uh, uh, STL uh, you know, library, to only take uh, those elements that are, that are the, the, the top uh, ones or, or the, the best ones uh, in, 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 inside a very, very large range if we don't really care about uh, the internal ordering among them, et cetera, and that's uh, the nth element uh, algorithm, and suddenly we can uh, drop from uh, uh, S times P uh, log S times P 
and uh, go down to an average uh, number of steps, which is uh, just linear in the length of the cells, which is really cool. And the next uh, uh, observation is that each of those columns that we're, we've created and that we're merging um, is actually already sorted by itself. Right? Uh, we know that uh, uh, each column is just the number of votes divided by the, the row number, so it's already sorted. And if you want to take the, like the nth element or want to, to, to merge uh, several uh, uh, you know, ranges that are already sorted, there's also an algorithm for that, the, the, uh, the, and that's merge. Okay? There's no range view for that, but there's, there's an algorithm in C++ 98 and also in C++ 20 for ranges. And those algorithms that we have uh, only accept uh, two input ranges, that are sorted and, and merges them, but potentially we can merge uh, ev even more. And um, the complexity of that operation can go even uh, further down to uh, S log P. Um, and uh, the last observation is that this merge operation is actually lazy in nature. Okay, it's something that's done on the fly. We just t pick the, the, the lowest or the, like the best number of each of the columns and, and, and push it out in every like plus plus or in every iteration. And that basically means that uh, we don't have to pre-allocate. We can create potentially uh, all those columns on the fly uh, and compose them into uh, like and do this entire uh, uh, algorithm without uh, pre-allocating, without uh, calculating all this information, all those cells and later dropping it. And that's uh, I think really uh, nice. Um, so this is my first uh, rabbit. I, I caught a rabbit. Um, of views for sorted ranges. Okay, we don't yet have views for sorted ranges. So the suggestion: let's uh, try to think about uh, uh, like a, a merge view, set union, set intersection, etc. That uh, the, the work on sorted ranges. Um, and the tip, obviously, you know, these things. These are things that can be done. Um, um, many of those algorithms can benefit uh, if, they, if, if we need to, to merge or work with multiple uh, inputs, uh, to just take the multiple inputs together and, and, and work on them together instead of doing like a pairwise reduction. Um, that typically uh, means using uh, some structure like a heap or a priority queue, um, which needs to be maybe allocated, needs to, need, can, can take room by its own. And uh, this is not uh, new to, to STL. STL contains uh, several algorithms for sorted ranges that are not views at the moment. And um, there are obviously other algorithms that are not uh, uh, in, in this list that, that exist for, uh, range, uh, for sorted out ranges, such as uh, upper bound and lower bound, equal range, and, and even uh, unique. And uh, all of these operations are lazy in nature, so they can be uh, considered to be views. The ranges v3 library, by the way, it has views for set union, set intersection, and symmetric difference, etc., uh, which means that there is some intention, at least by Eric Niebler, to maybe go and add uh, those to the standard. Um, they, there's still now a, a merge uh, view in ranges v3. There's actually a pull request uh, pending for that. And all those views currently support just two input ranges, and potentially they can be uh, improved, enhanced to accept uh, multiple input ranges, either like known at compile time, like variadic, or at runtime. Uh, the D language also has uh, its own uh, ranges library, and it does have uh, both a compile time, like multi-input uh, merge called merge, and a runtime multi-input merge called a multi-way merge that we can definitely share inspiration from. The interesting thing that I found when looking into the D library is that uh, it's multi-way merge that needs to merge basically an, uh, a number of inputs that is not known at, uh, um, at uh, compile time, some, in many ways, in many cases, it doesn't need to allocate uh, uh, the priority queue. It doesn't need to allocate a heap. It has this notion where it knows sometimes that uh, this uh, range view uh, is allowed to manipulate and, and perform swaps on this uh, range that it's uh, working on, that it receives as an input. And in those cases, it can basically create uh, or heapify the, the, the input range and, and, and work with that instead of uh, allocating memory, which is something quite novel. I'm not sure if it's uh, how to think about it in the C++ world, but potentially, you know, we can draw inspiration out of that. So that's uh, my first uh, uh, rabbit or first thought. And let's, uh, let, let's go a little deeper. Let's, uh, let's uh, look in, in even uh, more uh, down, down the rabbit hole, so to speak. Um, so where equal range and unique in the standard, they also potentially can view, be viewed. They're, they're algorithms, but their signature in terms of their inputs and outputs is just like the signature of a range. They, they receive a single range as an input. They uh, and sometimes uh, like other other extra arguments. They they output a single range um, uh, out. So they, they can be uh, views. They're not views, but but they can be. And um, 
What about the search operations? What about the uh, lower bound, upper bound, and the uh, uh, binary search? Can they be, uh, you know, used and made more composable in, in, in the ranges world? Um, so I was thinking that uh, potentially th there, there can be room for it. Uh, like uh, we have a take and take, well, why, why not uh, take until or drop until, which where we can do like a, a, a binary search for a value. And then once we, once we do that, we can filter out everything up until uh, that value or, or from that value. Uh, I think that could potentially be nice. Right now, all we have is uh, those take and, and drop uh, views that uh, can work on uh, like a predetermined number of items and not based on the values. We also have the filtering uh, uh, view, which goes on items one by one and doesn't um, you know, make any use of the fact that a range uh, can be pre-sorted. Now, obviously, uh, take until doesn't really need to, uh, uh, to do any binary search. You can just take one item, at a, like you can take items one by one until it reaches uh, the value that it wants or it reaches a, a larger value that it wants. Uh, but if you want uh, that range to be sized, for its size to be known, that's when uh, uh, potentially uh, uh, like a logarithmic uh, binary search can come into play. Um, and then we can also think about the uh, take between. This is something that uh, comes up a lot actually uh, uh, in my line of work. Uh, we do uh, uh, time series uh, analysis and many times we just want to take uh, something that's within a certain range. Uh, and uh, it's actually more efficient if we know that we have a sort of range and want to find a, a minimum point and a, and a maximum point to look for them together instead of uh, looking uh, for the minimum one and then looking for the, uh, for the maximum one out of that, uh, whatever's left. Because uh, you know, the, the first few uh, steps in this logarithmic search can sometimes uh, be merged together. So that, there's another idea, another potential uh, piece of our library. Um, so now if we have many, many uh, algorithms, that are specifically for sorted ranges, as uh, you know, uh, Eric Niebler mentioned. Uh, out of that, maybe we can think about concepts. Okay, if we have, if these things come up a lot, and if uh, you know people might uh, misuse uh, our, our, these uh, uh, new views and pass them non-sorted ranges, violate the preconditions. Maybe we can help them. Maybe we can create a concept, and the concept uh, can say that uh, this range is not only like bidirectional or sortable; it's actually sorted already. And uh, maybe if we have that, uh, that concept, the concept, uh, like any object that uh, adheres to that concept, could also give us access to the correct comparator. So we won't need to guess uh, what the range is sorted by, which is another a nice potential thing. And uh, the D language, again, uh, has it. And it also has uh, two uh, algorithms. I'm not sure if they're called views or not uh, in D, which are called is sorted and assume sorted. So is sorted takes uh, a range that is not sorted and uh, will optionally return a, a sorted range out of it if the specific uh, uh, you know, comparator holds, if the predicate holds in it is sorted, and assume sorted just uh, goes and runs in, in constant time and just tacks on a comparator to, uh, uh, to a range to make it uh, you know, adhere to, to the concept uh, without checking it, just, just trying to assume that uh, the programmer or that we know what we're doing. Um, and uh, another thing that we can do when we think about sorted ranges is just uh, creating our own vocabulary. So um, here again, let's think about uh, this uh, very, very short uh, snippet of code where we uh, take a range, we know it's sorted, we can chunk by equals, so we can have just a range of ranges of all the items that are equal to each other. And uh, as uh, we heard uh, by, by the Sebastian, I think uh, just a few minutes ago, using equals here uh, for range that's sorted by stood colon colon less can sometimes be problematic. We need to make sure that our types are regular in that sense. And uh, after we have those ranges, this, this range of ranges of items that are equal, we can transform each of those like sub ranges into just a pair of uh, like the, I guess maybe there's a, an asterisk missing here, like the first, like the item and, and its size, the number of its occurrences. And what's that? That's a histogram. Okay, so this is very, very simple. Anyone who wants to do it can do it potentially with, with the other building blocks that we have. But maybe this is a nice type of uh, you know, vocabulary to add to our language. So people know that they can create histograms over their uh, sorted ranges. We can also create histograms of non sorted ranges if we maybe have some hash tables uh, at our disposal. Question? Uh, 
yeah, so uh, the question is uh, about this uh, duality of uh, you know, range uh, adapters and views uh, that can be looked as, uh, as objects that represent uh, algorithms and whether it's okay to really do this uh, stepwise creation of composing these different views without yet knowing what the range uh, that's going to, uh, to be used for them uh, in, in one step and then uh, passing it over and using it on range later on. And this is something that can be done, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so take while, as far as I recall, uh, takes a lambda, okay, and uh, goes over each element until a lambda is, is, is true. And it, uh, in that case, uh, for that reason, take while um, really doesn't have any knowledge and, and doesn't have any precondition about the fact that uh, the items in the range are sorted, okay? And, and we just run a lambda. We don't know wh whether the lambda looks for a single uh, value or, or, or for more values. Uh, if we do a take until for a certain value, and we know we have precondition or a concept that uh, uh, this uh, input range is sorted, we can do the, bin the, the binary search and run it logarithmic time. We don't have to call the lambda on each and every item. Okay. This is specifically true for, uh, as mentioned, for, for the drop until uh, case and f for the take until to be sized. Yes, that, that's very true. Potentially, if, if, we, if a library goes and creates different concepts for different types of ranges and the sort of range is a concept uh, of its own, then uh, you, you can potentially like, have, have specialization, have uh, user requires clauses or other mechanisms to make, sh to make it so the same uh, range view with the same name just operates uh, more efficiently on sorted ranges than non-sorted ranges, et cetera. This is something that definitely uh, can be done. So if we would go and uh, implement uh, um, like uh, take until or drop until uh, that accepts uh, sorted ranges. We can also make it work on non-sorted ranges by doing the, I guess, labor-intensive work. And again, we might we might be confusing our users. We need to think about that as well. If for 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 sorted sized uh, uh, ranges, but but I think that the. Potentially, uh, it, uh, yeah, it, it doesn't really matter if they're lazy or not lazy. It matters if they're the random access. They, they can jump to the middle in, in, in a short time. Okay, if I can jump to the middle in a short time, then I can jump to the like either to 25 percent or 75 percent in a short time. It, it can still be lazy. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm, but again, this is just, these are just raw ideas, but, but definitely, uh, as far as I can tell, the main thing that we need is to know that things are shorted and we can do those, uh, uh, those uh, random access uh, jumps in, in our uh, input, okay? Great, so. Uh, Come and add this, go catch rabbits. Okay, let's go catch more rabbits, okay? Um, so now let's uh, go even deeper and try to break uh, sort of part. This is inspired by uh, the R standard library and uh, where, where I work at Istro, we use uh, R quite a lot as our uh, main research uh, language. And uh, it basically, uh, th this idea is uh, um, predicated on the fact that uh, we know that sort is an n log n operation, right? But it's actually n log n in two aspects. It does n log n comparisons and projections it also does n log n swap operations, okay? And um, the basic notion uh, is that uh, typically people think that those things are as cheap, uh, each of them is, is as cheap or as expensive as, as the other. And uh, you know, there are proofs that uh, without some, any extra knowledge, um, the number of uh, comparisons can't really go down below uh, n log n. But uh, the number of uh, swaps uh, can sometimes uh, be, be better. And, uh, if swaps are much more expensive than comparisons, then we might want to consider those things. And uh, the example that comes to mind uh, from like data analytics uh, standpoint is if we want uh, to have uh, a table, like a two-dimensional table, maybe columnar one, then we want to sort all of the table based on a single column. Okay, so we want to sort the rows of a table based on a single column. Um, comparisons are comparisons that are done in one column. 
but the, the, the swaps need to swap all the rows around in all the columns, uh, which can be much more expensive. Um, so uh, what's, uh, uh, what's the solution? What, what's an approach for that? The approach that we can do is to just break sort apart into its more finer grained building blocks. Um, yeah, and by the way, the fact that we have projections in C20 really stresses the fact that sometimes the comparison doesn't really compare those elements that we are swapping. They're comparing just slivers of them, just, just you know, perspectives on them, which can be may maybe easier to, uh, to compare than to swap. So uh, order is a potential uh, algorithm that uh, one could write, which uh, doesn't really sort, it just generates the sorting permutation. Okay, it, uh, uh, it doesn't really touch the input, but it just uh, tells you what are the indexes uh, that we might uh, uh, you know, want uh, to, uh, to, to switch this or, or, or to, to permute uh, the input range uh, by if you wanted to sort it. Okay, so, uh, so this uh, type of algorithm um, requires uh, some, some memory allocation. It requires memory for those n uh, indexes, which is obviously not uh, cheap. Um, and it does uh, n log n comparisons, but we don't need to do those uh, swaps. Or we, we're only swapping indexes, right? And uh, then once we have that uh, permutation, we can go ahead and apply that permutation. Okay, so the main operation that one can do with the permutation is to apply it on a range. And that does exactly an iter swap operations. Okay, so we can save those iter swaps if we're willing to pay the extra cost of, 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 of memory and indexes. Okay, and if we dig a little deeper, um, we can think that impl implementing this order function is potentially very easy. It can be like a one-liner, uh, right? We can use IOTA to basically, an, or, or like, a, or, an, or enumerate, or we can use IOTA to create uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, range of, of indexes from one to n, or from zero to n minus one, and then use projections so that we can compare uh, those indexes based on the, the ranges of the input values. But they, these things can be done in, in better ways as well. Um, so this, uh, uh, you know, can be an improvement to some people, breaking up uh, um, the sorting into, into these two uh, different uh, parts. And uh, this leads me, led me to thinking about uh, permutations. Um, so uh, permutations, they are more flexible than just uh, as an intermediate step. It's something that we can create in order to reduce the number of swaps. If we have a permutation in our hand, we can also reverse it. So we can sort the information, work on it sorted, and then we can go back to the original order because the permutation is something that can easily be reversed. Applying a permutation is also a lazy operation. It's something that can be lazily applied. So again, potentially, if all you want to do is uh, and do some, some, some like minor amount of operation on like the this, this sorted table, sorted by rows, um, it might make sense for us to never touch it, to not move it at all, not to swap it at all, and just, uh, uh, just put the sorting or the, 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 the sorting permutation as a lazy view over the information. And this uh, can, you know, it, it ha potentially has like performance costs when it comes to like, cache coherency, prefetching, et cetera, et cetera. But it means that our main, you know, corpus of data can be potentially untouched, which can make it more thread safe, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there are currently uh, iterator adapters in various libraries that implement this uh, permutation things. Uh, the Boost library has uh, fancy iterators that uh, apply permutations, and also NVIDIA Thrust has uh, those uh, um, types of fancy iterators. Uh, which can potentially, as mentioned, become uh, range-based uh, uh, views. So um, STL, by the way, has other algorithms, unrelated algorithms that, that deal with permutation. We can, uh, we can go over all the permutations of a certain, uh, of, of a certain uh, you know, range of, uh, uh, of ranges of a certain size, take the next one, take the previous one, et cetera. And again, if we start seeing permutations uh, cropping up more and more into, the, um, into our language, we can think about uh, concepts for them, okay? So we can think about a permutation concept or permutation of a range, which is a concept. So these are all things that we can uh, think about. Okay, so. I'm going to add this. Go get tremendous. Okay, so uh, uh, this is uh, uh, an another uh, rabbit, another you know, building block, another you know, component that we can add to our library if we find it useful, if we see that we use it or use these types of things in our own code bases or have use for them. Um, great, so uh, any questions so far? We're wrapping up uh, into our last slide. Great, so uh, what we talked about, we basically um, talked about libraries. We talked about the fact that uh, working with libraries and conceptualizing 
sort of a duality between library code and application code uh, can make our software sometimes better, safer, and cleaner. Makes it, it can cause us, or it will let us think in, in more uh, abstract, theoretical, generic forms and potentially can uh, make those complicated uh, pieces of, uh, of code that we have more encapsulated, more testable, more time uh, robust. The C++ ranges library is really a good uh, example of, of composability. It's something we can look, study at, and think, uh, not just where can we use ranges in our own uh, uh, code base, but what components, what types of uh, words and, and, uh, and, and algorithms we have in our own uh, uh, domain uh, knowledge that, that can, you know, be, uh, can, can also be enhanced by this uh, level of composability, by these uh, notions. And uh, potential libraries and potential new components, they're all around us. It's not just in the STL, it's not just on GitHub. We can, we can find libraries wherever we look, or potential ones, and we can go and write and implement them ourselves. Um, and even the C++ ranges library, you know, is not, is not complete. It can be, there, there can be add-ons to it that can be done either inside or outside the, um, or outside the, the STL itself. Um, so uh, I'll just leave you with uh, the phrase and uh, a big uh, encouragement to go catch rabbits. Thank you. Okay, any thoughts, questions? Yeah? I can repeat, yeah. No, no, you, you. Um, a question about uh, uh, build time, because that's something that's been some, somewhat painful with the ranges library. How is that, if, if you had experience with the, the, new, the new functionality that's added to 2023, how is that looking with like, the modern compiler? Okay, so the question is about build times for uh, ranges and, and composed uh, range libraries. And uh, yeah, the basic thing with uh, ranges is they are all template based and they are, as you can think, uh, expression templates. And that's what allows the compiler to do all the magic of uh, really uh, crunching everything into one very, very um, optimized uh, uh, coded runtime. And it can have a, a, a cost at compile time. But actually, my experience is that, uh, as mentioned, most algorithms that we use, they're not too complicated. They don't have layers and layers and layers of, uh, uh, of, uh, you know, of, of, of these uh, constructs uh, written uh, all together. So we don't, I, I don't think uh, compilation time is, is much of an issue. And uh, you know, ideally, the lazy notion um, of, of these uh, ranges that we use um, you know, can hide a, some better runtime uh, uh, you know, improvement and, 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 and potential gain that it, it will make everything else uh, worth it, hopefully. Great, more questions, comments? Okay, I really appreciate uh, your time. Hope you uh, took away something uh, nice. Thank you.